Omaha Commonwealth. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the 16th annual John Geddes Lecture, named for the founder of our Law and Government Institute, Emeritus Professor John Geddes. We are delighted to have John with us today. Welcome, John. At Widener Law Commonwealth, our mission is to produce professionals, lawyers who are highly ethical, mindful of the public interest, and engaged as leaders in their communities. We seek to transform promising students into skilled lawyers who know the law and use the law to compassionately solve problems, whether they serve in government or in the private sector. Our signature programs, the Law and Government Institute, the Environmental Law and Sustainability Center, and the Business Advising Program all seek to engage our students in this most important work. Today, we celebrate our Law and Government Institute, which helps students explore how the government works and the roles that lawyers play in making and implementing the law. I hope that you find today's lecture engaging and thought-provoking. It is now my pleasure to introduce Professor Jill Family, who is the faculty advisor to the Law and Government Institute. Professor? Thank you, Dean Hussey. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm so glad that we're able to gather for our annual Get It Lecture. And I just wanted to take a few minutes to say a few more words about John Gedded, who, as Dean Hussey mentioned, is able uh, to join us today. Uh, not only was John Gedded the founding dean of Widener Law Commonwealth, so literally the school wouldn't exist without him, um, he also started the Law and Government Institute. So it is very much his vision that we continue to implement today with myself as faculty advisor to the Institute and Rob Teplitz, who is directing the Institute. And so just a big thanks for all of us, for, from all of us at Widener Law Commonwealth to John Gedded for all that he has done, um, both to get the law school started and also to put us on such a wonderful path. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Lindsay Williamson, who is one of our student leaders who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Professor Family. The Law and Government Institute is pleased to present this year's Get It Lecture speaker, Carrie Colonisi. Professor Colonisi is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania's Carey Law School, where he teaches courses on administrative law, environmental law, regulatory law and policy, and policy analysis. He is also the founding director of the Penn Program on Regulation. Professor Colonisi specializes in the study of administrative law and regulatory processes with an emphasis on the empirical evaluation of alternative processes and strategies and the role of public participation, technology, and business government relations and policy making. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Mr. Kerry Colonisi. Thank you very much, uh, Lindsay, for that nice introduction. Uh, thank you, uh, Dean Husi and, and Professor Family for the invitation and the opportunity to be here. Uh, and of course, I wanna thank uh, John Geddes for um, his leadership in the profession and for uh, his leadership in this lecture. I'm very honored to be with you today to share uh, my thoughts about the future of, of law and a, especially a future in light of advances in artificial intelligence. Now, as with any talk about the future, uh, there's going to be uh, some limitations on what I can say with definitiveness. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of questions about where new artificial intelligence technology will take us. But I do think there's some things that we can say uh, already by way of, of trends. Uh, I've been looking at, at some of these issues uh, for uh, over 20 years now, from the beginning of uh, of what was known in the 1990s as e-rulemaking to currently serving as chair of a National Academy of Sciences committee, trying to look forward to the challenges, many of which are related to automation in the maritime industry and its regulation. Uh, along the way, I've been thinking about and writing a, a fair amount about the role of artificial intelligence in the administrative state. Now, there's going to be a lot of implications for artificial intelligence 
and its use by the private sector uh, and what that will all mean for society. Uh, I'm going to focus today on its implications for administrative governance, for the the day-to-day -day workings of administrative governance. And with that in mind, uh, here's just it, in five simple points what I hope to get across today throughout my lecture. First, and this is uh, perhaps the most evident right now, but also the most uncertain. We know that AI technology is being implemented already by uh, government agencies in their domestic policy and implementation of public administration. Uh, and it's already uh, being put to use, and I think it will transform administrative governance in important ways. But the challenge we face is to make sure that it transforms governance in a way that delivers on balance more good than harm. And it's not to say that governance will be perfect uh, with uh, the application of artificial intelligence, th that it won't even introduce some new problems, but the question and the challenge before us, I think over the next uh, decade, uh, at least if not beyond, will be to figure out how to make this transformative transformation in a way that ends up on balance to be better uh, than what we have today, which is far from a perfect system of governance. Uh, I will say that I don't think current administrative law is sufficient to ensure that we can meet that challenge of, of a net positive transformation. And I'll explain why, in some ways, I think uh, yeah, governing the use by of artificial intelligence is uh, the apotheosis of, yeah. of all that administrative law is, is seeking to accomplish. Uh, I'm going to suggest that where we're going to go need to go in the future is through uh, the implementation of what I'm going to call management-based standards to help ensure that we have uh, applications of, of artificial intelligence uh, that are tested, uh, that are monitored, and that are performing in responsible ways. And lastly, uh, I hope that in the future we're going to see this transformation occur in a way that, that, that actually preserves, if not even enhances, the role of human empathy in future governance. And arguably, uh, I think we may be able to find ways, if we're thoughtful, of improving uh, government and its, and its empathy toward uh, those that it governs. So with that, let me just set the, the stage with a little historical walkthrough of how law was practiced uh, 30 years ago using these kind of books. And then uh, about that time, uh, this little contraption came about, which uh, uh, many people in the audience may have never seen, but for those uh, who were uh, uh, practicing around the time that Lexus came out, uh, you knew that there was one single terminal that could be found in a law library, whether at a at a law school or at a law firm, uh, that you had to limit your amount of time on it to do uh, research. But of course, today, what do we all have? We have access to Lexis and Westlaw available on our laptops, on our tablets, and our phones. And rather than learning the very special language that the red machine uh, required you to master, you can put in natural language to do a lot of your searching. So uh, that's where we had been up until last year, really. And then uh, come November, we had uh, the uh, introduction of chat GPT 3.5 that scored on the uniform bar exam, which is a multiple choice uh, and essay exam at the 10th percentile. Not very respectful, gave a lot of confidence still that uh, there was a, uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, still, uh, 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 differentiation between humans and machines. But then uh, what do we find come March of this year, just last month, OpenAI introduced its next version of ChatGPT and it scores at the 90th percentile. And if you look at their, what's called system card, you can find the documentation for that. Now, just think about that, how profound that is really. We, uh, as humans, go to law school for three years, and we spend three months 
uh, during the summer studying for the bar exam to be able to take it. And within about three or four months, just upgrading, going from one version of ChatGPT to the other, uh, you've seen this dramatic uh, improvement in what it's able to do on tasks that humans right now perform. This uh, transformation, which is not just in terms of its performance on the bar exam, but in creating a much more human-like uh, receptivity and, and responsiveness to queries has led to uh, thousands of, of uh, industry insiders and others to sign on recently to an open letter calling for a six-month pause and for others to say, wait a minute, six months, we need something longer. Maybe we need 30 years even. Uh, why? Because uh, this technology has uh, really demonstrated uh, uh, human capabilities of, of 90 percentile level of performance on even uh, an essay-based uh, uh, bar exam. It, really quite remarkable where this is all going to go. So what we, uh, we want to do, what I want to do is just first of all set a little bit of groundwork. Why why is this even possible? What is this technology? And let me just start by, by saying, what is this machine learning algorithm technology? It's a predictive approach to data analysis. It leads to forecasts, uh, outputs based upon data inputs. And some of the synonyms are artificial intelligence, predictive analytics, reinforcement learning. There's actually a wide range of of different types of machine learning algorithms. So I'm going to be rather general in our uh, in, in this lecture here today. But in general, what these algorithms do is they tend to, they're learning by selecting variables and sometimes even the functional form of, of the relationship, the mathematical relationship between these variables through repeated exploration with data. One, just one type of machine learning, often called random forest, actually tries many different combinations of variables and functional forms until it finds the one that yields the best forecast. We see uh, the uh, uh, implications of machine learning whenever we uh, go to uh, a a Amazon and it uh, gives us uh, predictions of what else we might like to buy, for example. But what is not machine learning? What are we not talking about? It's not, this is not traditional statistical analysis, which had equations like this that uh, were specified by humans that picked the variables and the functional forms between them. And because humans could select them, and even as complex as they might seem, they could be nevertheless uh, more easily intu and intuitively predictable. What we have with, in with machine learning, however, though, is a process that leads to much more accurate and precise forecasts of outcomes because it's not humans that are selecting the variables and the functional forms. And to some extent, the, those variable selection and the functional form selection is, is informed by, by theory and domain knowledge, but, but the, the algorithms uh, through exploration of the data, finding patterns within the data uh, can lead to much more accurate and precise uh, forecasts of, of outcomes. And by large amounts of data here, just keep in mind that chat GPT which is the open AI version of the, a large language model or generative uh, AI uh, a, a technology. Uh, Google has come out with its own version called BARD. Uh, China's Alibaba just today uh, announced its own version. We're talking about processing and finding patterns in billions of data, analyzing the sweep of words and language in those in, in, in those uh, technologies through uh, the entire internet, finding the patterns and then making forecasts about when a particular prompt is given, what would be based upon patterns in the data uh, on the internet and, and in human language already, what would be the patterns that would could be generating a response that would um, uh, would 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 be sensible 
and 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 hopefully accurate. And as uh, the data uh, from uh, the change from chat GPT 3.5 to version 4 indicates on the uniform bar exam, it's uh, doing uh, pretty, pretty well at that. Uh, but it's trained and looking for patterns on uh, large volumes of data. These uh, systems, then this technology can be built into automated systems, whether it's uh, chat systems. So you could have an automated response uh, uh, for customer service, for example. Uh, with with something like a chat GPT. Uh, you can also uh, build it into automated systems for uh, making, as I indicated, Amazon or Netflix recommendations. There, one of the first uses of this technology in the federal government sector was actually in recognizing handwriting by the, in the U.S. Postal Service implemented uh, machine learning technology to help read and process the mail better. Uh, that's an example of using this in an automated system. But it's because of the learning nature, the self-learning nature of these algorithms, it's less intuitively obvious how the outcomes come about, what explains them. That's why these are sometimes referred to as black box uh, algorithms. No human is selecting the variables or functional forms. And uh, by and large, this technology doesn't, it, it leads to forecasts, but not necessarily causal claims. So we can't, from uh, this technology, very easily say, well, if someone increases or decreases a certain variable, it will be more or less likely to generate a different outcome. Uh, that's, that's difficult. But but it is being used widely in the private sector. And, uh, and I think we're, we're already seeing indications of a lot of firms wanting to deploy the um, large language models in chat systems and in search algorithms um, in uh, systems like uh, Alexa uh, on Amazon and so forth to, uh, uh, to be able to interact uh, with uh, with customers, it's service operations optimization. One of the really the most popular uses right now, according to a survey uh, by McKinsey and Company. And that I think is indicative, and the reason I mention it is indicative of where we're likely to see this being deployed in the federal government and in state and local governments in the years ahead, especially as. Uh, people get accustomed to the kind of service that these AI tools provide, uh, they're going to be asking, why aren't we uh, getting that same kind of service from in the public sector as well? We do see already, and the Administrative Conference of the United States has affirmed this, we do see some uses of artificial intelligence uh, at the local, state, and federal levels of government in the United States and in governments around the world. Uh, it is changing how government agencies, we're, we're seeing them use artificial intelligence for service administration, uh, determining where to send uh, 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 various social services. Uh, the city of Chicago is determining where to place uh, the um, uh, pest control uh, bait and, and other kinds of, uh, of traps uh, around the city based upon an artificial intelligence tool. It's going to improve uh, the ser services. Uh, uh, there's uh, civil enforcement uh, being used to allocate scarce inspectors and target cases of fraud and uh, or, 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 or the city of New York using it to determine where to send building inspectors and fire inspectors. Uh, we do see law enforcement uses of this in a controversial ways, but also allocating uh, police patrols. Formal adjudication at the federal level, the Social Security Administration has used an artificial intelligence tool for quality control purposes, not to actually do adjudication, but at least to, to review the quality of uh, its administrative law judges' uh, performance and decision-making. Uh, we see this being used in informal adjudication. If anybody's come in uh, from overseas and encountered the facial recognition software, 
uh, as you uh, enter the airport and return to the United States. Uh, that's an example that's powered by machine learning algorithms. Agencies are certainly using this for research underlying rulemaking, and they have been using it for analyzing uh, public input in the rulemaking process. A few years ago, uh, researchers from Stanford and NYU uh, charged some graduate students to look for all the possible use cases of artificial intelligence across the federal government. And uh, this is the distribution that they found. Most of the uses at that time uh, were, were being uh, uh, devoted to research and analysis. Uh, some uses for enforcement, uh, the next biggest category, uh, usually in targeting where to look for fraud, where the IRS could uh, potentially find uh, 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 taxpayer audits that, that would, would have violations of tax regulations and so forth. Uh, some for public services, in engagement, internal management, and uh, adjudication uh, review. So it is being used today. Uh, and uh, uh, and the good question might be, you know, why? Why are they using it? Well, the simple answer is to overcome human limitations. Uh, th this is the case for using artificial intelligence anywhere, but certainly in, in government, we have to recognize that human decision makers have uh, limitations. We have physical limitations. Humans can only uh, generally hold four to five uh, variables in their mind at one point in at any point in time. And yet, keep in mind the power of the of the machine learning algorithms is that they can find pattern recognition in in uh, upwards of billions of variables. Uh, obviously, we have other kinds of physical limitations. We also have a whole host of of biases uh, as well. And uh, when we get together in groups, whether it's on, you know, a collective uh, committees or or panels of of judges or um, or, or or group decision making in task forces uh, within agencies or in legislatures, uh, we know that there's a host of of deficiencies and dysfunctionalities that can arise. Uh, so we're not perfect. Uh, that's not to say that artificial intelligence is, but but the search here is to find ways to overcome these human limitations, and sometimes uh, they can do that very well. And uh, for example, when it comes to reading uh, handwriting on uh, mail, the, 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 the U.S. Postal Systems software uh, performs much faster and more efficiently and accurately uh, even than humans can. So... Um, this is what's driving the interest in artificial intelligence. This is what's driving, I think, the, the most optimistic vision going forward for artificial intelligence. And as I'll say in a, a little bit, uh, there's some research that shows uh, that this is really indeed working. I want to just step back uh, to thinking about how uh, this might be used in the chat GPT context uh, and uh, I was looking back recently at a report that I published uh, 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 over uh, 20 years ago now uh, through a project with the National Science Foundation in which uh, we brought together lawyers and, and public officials and computer scientists to try to identify ways that technology could help enhance the regulatory process. And one uh, idea in, in that report was that uh, it might be developed translation software that could take very complex regulations and translate them into plainer English uh, that could help facilitate uh, public understanding of rules and compliance with rules. So with that in mind, I said, well, let's take a look and see what ChatGPT could do. And I asked it, what are the current federal nitrogen oxide emissions limits for an automobile in the United States? And it gave me uh, an, a, a brief uh, and answer that's, that's understandable. And compared with, if you go to the Federal Register, uh, the hundreds of pages uh, of the EPA's regulation, this was a nice little summary. And if you go to Google's BARD, uh, you can find a similar uh, sort of uh, answer. Uh, notice, however, any perceptive uh, viewer that 
the uh, chat GPT version and the BARD version are giving me some different answers. And there are uh, you know, clearly, clear examples of this technology hallucinating, uh, making up, uh, and one has to be careful about its accuracy. But it does show you at least the potential for that kind of translation software and how maybe in the future as this develops and if it develops at the pace that it has from chat gpt 3.5 to chat gpt 4 it's going to be uh, just getting more accurate uh, over time now we do have stepping back we do have actually uh, some very solid research that indicates that artificial intelligence tools can outperform administrators in a variety of settings. A research study looked at uh, the use of a machine learning tool to identify passengers during the COVID pandemic who were asymptomatic uh, and shouldn't be getting on airplanes. And using that tool improved uh, the Greek border officials' uh, ability to identify those uh, infected but asymptomatic travelers uh, on the order of two to four times uh, better than than they had. Uh, another study shows that the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency could identify uh, six times as many water pollution violators by using artificial intelligence tools. And another study shows that uh, in uh, 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 domestic violence cases, uh, using machine learning to make arraignment decisions could cut down rearrest by 50 percent. These are just some of the studies that indicate uh, the power of these tools and how they can, uh, when designed well and used responsibly, lead to better outcomes for the public. Uh, what about then the possibility of using AI as law itself? By that, I mean that AI could be used to determinatively set rules, what I've called rulemaking by robot, or to determinatively uh, settle matters and issue binding orders, or what I would call adjudicating by algorithm. Let me just give you an example, a hypothetical example of what AI as law could entail. What we have right now uh, in the area of aviation safety is a regulation that says that no one may serve as a pilot of a commercial aircraft uh, if they are over 65 years of age, 65 years or older. Now, this kind of rule, like many rules in law, has the traditional and well-known problems of over and under-inclusiveness. Uh, there is not really something that magically happens when someone goes from their being the age of, of, of 64 and 364 days uh, to their 65th birthday that suddenly makes them uh, qualitatively less safe to fly, uh, and that and there will be some number of pilots under the age of 65 who are not safe, uh, and there will be some who are over 65 who are are not only safe, may be safer than those who are younger. It's no accident that it was a very experienced and older pilot who is really close to the threshold here. Uh, for the the age limit on piloting, who who was able to land uh, a commercial aircraft on the Hudson River when its engines were were disabled uh, in flight uh, and saved all the passengers. So that's the that's the problem with the current current rules. What if? And this is again hypothetical, but it's it's a way of thinking about how AI could be used to replace law. Suppose that instead of having a very simple 65 year age threshold, we instituted an AI tool that made a prediction about uh, a, an individual's ability to fly aircraft in a safe manner. And a, the pilot's license is issued not based upon age, but based, based upon a tool that accurately forecasts uh, pilots' uh, ability to fly safely. Now, uh, again, I wanted to see uh, if something like AI as law itself might be usable today. It's something that actually 20 years ago, I argued uh, we might see information technology that could transform uh, rules from the text, like the 65 
year age threshold uh, into software packages and algorithms, what I called at that time TurboTax rules. Uh, but we could think about what it would chat GPT do. And I just gave chat GPT a response uh, asking it to write a regulation governing uh, the use of chat GPT by federal agencies. And while it doesn't give me a, 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 a regulation of the kind one might find in the federal register, uh, it doesn't look uh, too dissimilar to the kinds of principles that one finds uh, in a wide variety of government uh, and think tank uh, reports and standards today. A nice 10 point list. Just if you're interested, I put the same prompt in BARD. And here it gives me a little bit more of a rule like structure, giving me the purpose, the scope, some definitions, and then policy, and then some requirements, uh, and even an effective date <laughs> for the regulation. Now, um, this again is very uh, limited. Uh, we're not there yet, but is this a path to where we're going? Uh, let me just say that we do have one instance where this, where there are rules actually being created automatically. They're very simple rules. They're not written down uh, in the way that I've asked ChatGPT or Bard to write them. But uh, we have in, in several of our major cities, Pittsburgh being one of them and Los Angeles being another, we have artificial intelligence that's driving the traffic signaling systems through these uh, cities. Uh, it's a learning technology, so no one really knows why at any given time, uh, on any given street, the traffic light is green and why it turns red when it does, but the system is designed so that the algorithm finds patterns based upon sensors that are in the streets, that can optimize for traffic flow. And I say that this is an instance of AI as law, just maybe more metaphorically, but, but in reality, for anyone who is on a particular street at a particular time, what that traffic light is showing is articulating a rule that you have to follow, uh, stop or go. Uh, so if we could think about uh, the future, we're, I think we're going to I think we have to recognize that we'll see other applications uh, similar to this and, and with increasing sophistication. Now, for some of you, that may seem unsettling, and there are reasons to be concerned, no doubt, about uh, how these systems uh, would work, particularly if we get beyond just something as basic as a traffic signaling system. Can administrative law help us? I don't think so. I think administrative law today uh, accommodates uh, the use of regulating by robot and adjudicating by algorithm. First of all, there's no statutes, I should say, right now or, or case law that are really squarely or directly on point. Uh, there are some uh, state level decisions, a, a case in, in Wisconsin, for example, on a risk algorithm used in a criminal law context, it really isn't a, a machine learning algorithm. Uh, there are other uh, cases that deal with other kinds of non learning algorithms as well. I do think that it's very going to be very clear that how a government uses machine learning will certainly be important if they use it for uh, uses that violate uh, First Amendment rights, well, that will uh, be problematic. But but in general, uh, the question I I guess is is there anything intrinsic about machine learning uh, that stands in tension with administrative law? And I don't think so. I just give you three major doctrines of administrative law and just uh, briefly walk through each of these to indicate how that even though. Uh, we are a, a system dedicated to government of the people and by the people, as Abraham Lincoln once said. Uh, we don't uh, necessarily, um, uh, I think, have a legal system that uh, prevents government agencies from relying on these tools, even to determine, uh, for example, whether somebody gets a pilot's license. Take non-delegation doctrine. Would it be unconstitutional to delegate authority to some uh, 
chat GPT or other artificial intelligence tool? I don't think it's likely. Why? Because that doctrine requires an intelligible principle. And algorithms, objective functions, the way they're designed, they necessarily have to be intelligible. They have to be mathematically precise. What is it that we're trying to optimize for? And uh, with um, something like ChatGPT, essentially, it's trying to optimize for every next word in a sentence and every next sentence in a paragraph. What's the probability that it matches a pattern that mirrors uh, the patterns found in billions and billions of data that uh, it's analyzed. So it's, it has to be mathematically precise. Is this uh, akin to a, some kind of unconstitutional delegation to a private entity? Because maybe AI is not truly governmental. Maybe, and, and in fact, in many cases, government agencies are relying on private contractors. I still don't think this is likely because algorithms themselves are not bringing the kinds of conflicts of interest that the private non-delegation doctrine uh, is all about. Uh, and they're working subordinate ultimately to government officials who have to design them and set them up and run them and could ultimately pull the plug on them. Uh, they are in effect a lot like a measurement tool. And just as government agencies have used machines and thermometers and other kinds of physical devices over the years, uh, a well-designed and well-validated uh, uh, algorithm would, would be akin to that. Take the due process clause. You might say, well, wait, shouldn't there be a right to a human decision? Uh, that is a, a concept that, that many are talking about. But under our current uh, standards for due process, I don't think that is likely to be a right to human decision making. The canonical doctrine is based upon Matthews v. Eldridge, and it calls for a balancing of three factors. The first factor are the private interests at stake. That's going to be what it's going to be, whether it's a human making the decision or an algorithm making the decision. So it's exogenous. But the other two are ones where uh, it should weigh in favor of the artificial intelligence tool. These should be more accurate and they're going to lower the costs of, of decision-making, speeding up the process. Keep in mind that under the status quo, we have a lot of delays as well as inconsistencies and biases that have been widely documented by human decision-makers. Lastly, what about reason giving? These are black box algorithms. So how can you square that with a governmental transparency that we demand? Wouldn't that violate the arbitrary and capricious standard, for example, because you can't really explain why these algorithms give the outcomes they, they give? Well, not likely. I don't think that likely. Uh, as long as you can disclose the assumptions and methods used and the validation techniques, I think you should be fine. And the courts have generally deferred to agencies anyway on complex matters, uh, which um, in Baltimore gas and electrics terms are at the frontiers of science. And that's where we're at. And agencies can engage in good practices to disclose how they develop their algorithms and, and, and how they've tested them. So I don't think we can really count on traditional uh, administrative law. In fact, in some ways, I, I think uh, uh, administrative law uh, maybe leads us to and will lead us to want to use uh, certain artificial intelligence tools. An automated state I've written could be thought of as the apotheosis of administrative law. Why? Because administrative law is all about the control of discretion. And these algorithms, if they are structured and formatted, the parameters are set, they're going to do what they've been designed uh, to do and not um, uh, necessarily... Uh, uh, run the problems that we've we've worried about in administrative law. However, does this always mean we should use AI? No. I mean, there's certainly going to be preconditions for its use. Uh, the kinds of sui generis situations that law encounters, it won't be uh, usable. You're going to need to have situations where it's very clear and precise what the goal is. Uh, optimizing for traffic safety for for pilots in a way that could be defined precisely. Uh, we're going to have to have data available. Uh, sometimes that won't be the case. A lot of government uh, information is not in machine usable form yet. Uh, we'll also need to have external validity to the data. So the way 
algorithms and uh, our, our, our learning algorithms operate. You train them on a training data set that then, and then you apply it uh, to new data. Well, if the world is changing, uh, you won't have external validity. Chat GPT was trained on data that were current as of September 2021. Uh, what does that mean? You won't find a whole lot of information or help from Chat GPT about how to deal with the current uh, war by Russia invading Ukraine uh, because that happened after uh, that algorithms model was trained. Um, we also need to look for when it's going to make a difference. It, we have to show that it will improve on the goals that we want to have uh, uh, met, that we have to look for the impacts on the direct users and make sure that there aren't side effects. Sometimes with, when people are engaged in goal-oriented behavior, they forget that actually there's multiple goals. Regulators in New Zealand a number of years ago shifted to a new way of regulating buildings that preserve the structural integrity of buildings in New Zealand, but they forgot that they also needed to make sure buildings were uh, resistant to moisture. And uh, when they shifted to that uh, single-minded goal, uh, they had a lot of buildings uh, that led to a major, major crisis in New Zealand, buildings with, with mildew. We've seen similar uh, experiences with uh, child-resistant packaging regulations in the U.S., initially designed to keep kids out of uh, medicines and, and household chemicals, also kept adults out, uh, too. And uh, actually, when the adults finally opened these things, they tended to leave them open, and we saw an increase in childhood poisoning. So have to think about uh, all the ways that, that users will be impacted uh, by the goals of artificial intelligence, bias certainly being one of those concerns too. And also just think about the broader societal impacts as well. Uh, if we're using AI to determine the, uh, uh, the safety of pilots, uh, we not only have to think about the pilots and how they're affected, but also think about the passengers uh, in the planes. Now, uh, the National Research Council has noted that the introduction of any new technology is likely to raise concerns about its impact on society, potential harm to the interest of individuals, threats to liberty or privacy being only some of the worries. I find this quote particularly interesting because it came from a National Research Council report in 1992 about DNA technology and particularly about the use of DNA technology in the courts. And at that time, uh, DNA technology was actually uh, being viewed with a good bit of skepticism. Uh, one court decision actually rejected its use uh, early on. And yet today, DNA technology is used uh, and thought of as the gold standard. So how do we get something like uh, a gold standard, if we're going to, uh, out of AI technology? Can we get beyond the current skepticism and fears about AI uh, to something that people are comfortable with, maybe even are demanding in the same way they demand for, um, uh, for DNA uh, testing today? Well, I think you're going to find that there's uh, several paths to consider. We need better standards. You see this with DNA. Uh, need impact assessment and auditing. Also see this as having happened with DNA. We'll need to syst have systems of oversight, and this court system has overseen DNA technology. We we'll have to figure out what's the best oversight for AI. And we've had standards for qualification and, and qualified personnel to use these tools. Because if we don't, we are going to have risks and uncertainties, perpetuating biases. There's concerns about these large language models persuading people to inflict harm on others or on themselves. There's concerns about spreading disinformation. There's obvious job dislocation uh, effects when we think about what this will do to transforming sectors of the economy, maybe like law, that um, have relied on, on humans to do a lot of tasks that now AI tools could do. We also have to think about a loss ultimately of human skill. The more we rely on AI to regulate or to adjudicate, uh, will we have people who can actually still understand whether those tools are working in a valid way? Uh, we all probably have less ability to navigate 
today once we start relying on on Google Maps, for example. And then there's a host of other unknown uh, adverse consequences. I think we're going to need to have governance that's agile, flexible, and vigilance going forward, in part because the AI is not one single technology for one single use. And that's why a, an approach to governance that I've called management-based, it's a model similar to the National Environmental Policy Act's environmental impact statement model. I think we may have to see uh, government agencies engaging in algorithmic impact assessments before they start to use these tools and, and be able to identify all the potential harms and demonstrate uh, that they've been using them well. I think government agencies also need to think about these issues when they're procuring private sector consultation services for AI. They need to ensure that government contracts uh, I'll provide for the private contractor to have an obligation to disclose information about that algorithm for proper oversight. And those contracts can also provide a basis for putting in place standards uh, for the responsible use of AI. Now, this doesn't mean that the every single use will have to be uh, um, uh, at the fullest due diligence, but the more that AI is being used in high stake areas to make decisions rather than just as an input to them, those are the red areas that we need to focus on more. I think some of the larger barriers to AI as law will be a completeness of goals. We, we, we have to actually know all of the goals, not just keeping children from opening bottles, but we want to make adults be able to open them too. That's going to be true in all sorts of applications of AI. We have to have some consensus on values and trade-offs. These uh, algorithms have to be math mathematically designed to optimize for some goals with constraints of others and trade-offs that will need to be defined mathematically in, in, in precise terms. We today in law often rely on what Cass Sunstein has called incompletely theorized agreements, reasonable care instead of mathematical precision. And we'll have to have data again to do all of this. We can overcome those barriers, but probably not perfectly. All we have to do, though, is overcome them so that systems work better than they do today. I think as people grow more accustomed to algorithmic decision-making tools in the private sector, they're going to come to expect that more in the private in the public sector as well. So custom will emerge, and 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 we also have to make sure we have competence. If AI as law or and and as governance does improve things, and if they can be demonstrated, then that's uh, going to I think lead to a greater uh, trust and acceptance of it. Finally, as I said at the outset, I think we have to preserve a role for human empathy, even in a system that's more fully automated uh, than we have today. Now, our current system is not necessarily always empathic. Anybody who uh, has gone for a driver's license may wonder whether we have a, a very empathic uh, system today. Bureaucracies can be cold and impersonal, even when they're organized by humans. But if we can uh, replace a lot of the drudgery work that humans are engaged in now, redirect them and find ways to build human points of contact in a system of the future that relies much more on automated tools, uh, that I think is the thing to do. Ultimately, uh, and to conclude, uh, I think the status quo uh, is far from perfect. And if we can find with responsible use of artificial intelligence tools, a way to do better, uh, producing faster, more accurate, more consistent outcomes, uh, and doing so with empathy, then that's what we should aim for. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take your questions. Well, Professor, we've got a number of questions in the chat, um, so I'll, I'll take them in order in the 10 minutes or so that we have left. Um, first question, do you think that AI could improve the application of Chevron deference? Well, I'm not sure Chevron deference is still the rule of law. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, that's that's one thing for sure. But I do here's the, how I think the the um, you know the, the, there there is going to be um, uh, a possibility of, of of figuring out whether an algorithm can can come up with uh, 
a clear meaning from particular statutory terms. And I think you could find that you could have uh, you know, computational tools, which already exist, quite frankly, to determine whether particular text is clear or ambiguous. And if that if Chevron is still with us and step one is still to find out whether the statute is clear or ambiguous, maybe we should be uh, actually not relying just on judges deciding whether it's, you know, it seems clear or not to them, but some objective way of determining the, the clarity or ambiguity in text. It's a it's a possibility. Absolutely. Great. Um, next question is also. Uh, how would AI relate to making credibility determinations? Well, uh, you know, we um, think we can do that as humans a lot better than uh, than we really can. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, book by uh, Malcolm Gladwell called uh, Talking uh, with Strangers or Talking to Strangers. And, um, he, you know, he reviews how people uh, think that they can determine whether a witness is is telling the truth or not. And people are just invariably overconfident about their ability to do that. So a well-validated uh, tool uh, could be quite useful uh, for that purpose. The next question relates to your point about the traffic lights in Pittsburgh. Um, and I apologize if I <laughs> mangle this question. Um, they asked, um, does the AI controlling the traffic lights conform to the federal MUTCD? Um, the person is asking because PennDOT incorporated that in the traffic control regulations. And so if AI doesn't conform to those regulations, then the AI would not be able to be legally used. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I don't happen to have the specif specifics around that particular issue, but um, uh, one would imagine that uh, uh, they've taken that into consideration. One would hope they have. I will say that in principle, it's possible to build into an algorithm various constraints. So it's not, you know, to have a, a you can have a, a system that not only optimizes for, for traffic control, but optimizes for traffic control subject to uh, specifically defined uh, constraints. And if and if that's uh, one that we need to you know, make sure that systems are are complying with, then. Um, uh, then it could, in principle, certainly be programmed into the algorithm. Uh, another question in terms of the impact of, of AI in this case, how could you see it affecting the rulemaking process? Um, for example, um, could people use AI to uh, draft comments to proposed mm -hmm. regulations? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And in fact, they already do. I mean, there are uh, there's an ACUS recommendation on um, mass comments and robo comments. Uh, so we have a lot of automated systems. I think what what's really uh, uh, transformational about the chat GPT technology and the large language models is that people could have um, now uh, mass comment campaigns that generate uh, comments that look different, uh, even though they're all uh, sort of saying the same thing, either in support of or or uh, in opposition to a proposed rule. Right now, what federal agencies are using are duplication software to sort through when they have a mass comment campaign, and they they will treat all of the comments that are identified as duplicate. That is saying exactly the same thing as 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 one comment essentially. Uh, with ChatGPT, mass comment campaigns will now be able to generate different kinds of comments automatically, but, but still, again, um, supporting or opposing a rule. And uh, the duplication software won't really work. So there'll be probably need for government agencies to develop other kinds of uh, software. There's now already uh, tools that use AI to try to detect whether ChatGPT has been used to create an essay. Uh, teachers uh, 
uh, know about this uh, this tool, for example. Uh, something like that could be deployed by agencies as well in helping analyze large volumes of comments. I should uh, add, by the way, th th there's other transformational purposes along these lines. A lot of uh, regulated entities right now have a lot of paperwork burdens where they have to file reports with government agencies, uh, securities disclosure reports. Um, these kind of large language models uh, may well be deployed uh, in the near future, really, to help firms generate that paperwork. We may find that agencies need to develop tools drawing on similar algorithms to process them and, and identify uh, potential areas of concern with them. So what we what the whole area of, of paperwork reduction that we have uh, built up over the years may well uh, be transformed because of these, these technologies. We've had a couple of questions about judges using chat GBT to draft opinions, um, or at least first drafts of opinions, and, and also how that might relate to uh, the transparency of the thinking process and judicial review. Mm -hmm. Sure, or you could think about agencies using them to develop preambles or the like. I mean, I think we'll see much more of that already. I believe a court in Columbia, if I'm not mistaken, has used chat GPT to develop uh, uh, a, a court opinion. Uh, I think uh, an agency in Canada, if I'm not mistaken, has relied on it to develop uh, uh, some response. Uh, so we're, we're gonna see those tools being used uh, increasingly. Uh, there's always been a question about transparency, by the way, right? Going back to the legal realists, uh, we are, you know, had always questions about whether what judges are writing themselves in their opinions. And by the way, uh, we've known judges now to be relying on clerks, right? So, so in some ways, these the large language models might be thought of as automated clerks. Uh, if judges use them in that way, there may be responsible ways to to do so. Uh, I do think um, uh, there's the risk, of course, that when these algorithms hallucinate, as it's called, uh, and create errors um, in in their reasoning, uh, we have to be concerned that that judges, uh, humans, and others are, are able to catch those concerns. I think the large concern going forward now, maybe this is decades off, is just a loss of human knowledge to be able to evaluate whether what an algorithm is producing. Uh, is really very meaningful or not. We have to maintain uh, graduates from law schools, uh, uh, humans who are going forward and, and, and gaining skills and thinking critically and, and so that they can still uh, assess the quality of these tools. Um, and, and a last question, I think this is an appropriate one. Uh, the New York Times uh, had an article this week that uh, the legal profession is one of the professions that is at most at risk um, of um, losing jobs, you know, due to artificial intelligence. Um, how big is that risk? Um, another way of asking this is, uh, should we continue to schedule CLEs or should we plan on this being our last CLE? You should still have CLEs. There's going to be uh, uh, no... Uh... Uh, immediate uh, decline in demand for legal services, uh, but will there be some change? Yes. Um, how how much? So uh, you know, there are lots of varying opinions about that. Uh, I think the more pessimistic ones are that there will be a lot fewer jobs for lawyers in the future. Uh, the more uh, perhaps optimistic ones are that lawyers can be freed of a lot of the the, the routine work uh, that, that they engage in, uh, they can become more efficient and hopefully deploy their skills uh, in, in, a, in, in a way that um, meets uh, better the demands for legal services. Uh, we, we, we have a lot of unmet needs out there today. And uh, if automation can help free up some of those resources so we can help other people uh, or some of the automated tools themselves can help people who are currently uh, unable to even find an attorney. These should be good things. So I'll leave on that optimistic note. That is a great place to end. Um, thank you for such a fascinating and timely topic.
uh, on behalf of the Law and Government Institute. And now I'll, I'll turn things back to Dean Hussey to close us out. Thank you, uh, Rob, for that. Um, it's great to have all of you here. Very insightful, Professor, on where we're going with artificial intelligence, uh, both in society and the legal profession. So thank you again uh, to all of our guests joining us today. We've been delighted. And thank you, John, get it as well for your leadership over all the years. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>